Okay, so the first letter is uh, quite epic in length. So we'll see how we get on. I know I'm missing the Sangha gathering has really shaken me up. And I'm also going to miss the class tonight, basically due to me being an idiot with how to manage my life. The way this has made me feel has forced me to look directly at my life, my motivations, my priorities, how I deceive myself, how I can slumber through life, and also how I have started going for refuge in the wrong places, like my job, my relationship, financial stability, family plans, owning a property, etc. I think I am just quite confused. So that's a good start to when we practice in the spiritual path. Again, we remember it's not an intellectual understanding. So we might spend quite a few years actually intellectually getting into our head what the spiritual path is. And as we start to live it, we realize we don't know what we're doing, where we're going. And as life presents itself in the moment, we see that what we actually want is the world. Yeah, so we come, it's, so the spiritual path, the intellectual map that we come to classes and study acts as a mirror, like a contrast from the, the usual map that we've been given, um, we start to understand we don't really know anything. And basically the spiritual path is actually really being com being com becoming comfortable with realizing that we are nothing without God's presence and we don't know what life is. It's a vast mystery and we're floating about nowhere. So it's, so it's all good. We, the spiritual path is very uncomfortable because we are trying to accept what is and we often can't accept what is and the ego is the voice on top of what is trying to make it not what it is yeah and to be able to sit with that confusion and uncomfortability you say it's like honey on the edge of the razors of the razor is be able to sit with pain, be able to sit with confusion, sit with anguish and be, be okay with it. So my girlfriend has been upset and crying regularly, but she told me she is very happy I stayed and I can see a huge improvement in her now. In the moment when I decided to stay, it felt like the selfless thing to do. However, if I'd gone to the gathering, Perhaps I would have come back more able to help her in the long run. I do not know. I just don't know the balance. As seeing her in distress, I just want it to be eased there and then. I am very soft in this way, but perhaps this isn't always the best thing. It seems as well that by not coming to the Sangha gathering, it also impacts negatively on the group and myself so there isn't really a way to avoid this negativity. Is this just part of life that I'm going to cause suffering to others? I really have a thing about people pleasing, especially in regards to my family, my partner, my friends, and people at work. Always being nice and never creating discord, but honestly it doesn't always feel authentic to who I am. So. So in general, hopefully, you know, if you were the spiritual being, you know, they won't put um, obligations onto you, as it were. But if you say you're um, going to do something with someone and you do something with someone else, then you've gone against your word and you've let them down. Yeah. That person, so generally a spiritual person like that, they can be easier. It feels like it's easier to let down. 
because they're not putting obligations on you. They will say, okay, and they remain fine. So if you imagine a wrathful spiritual teacher, who if you let them down once, will really tell you off. You, people tend not to, to do that. So you have to be able to figure it out yourself, and most people can't. That every time you say you're going to do something, you don't. You're letting people down. You're letting yourself down. You're letting other people down. And then you're giving in to um, the damsel in distress. Yeah. So this is how generally uh, um, we can say men do it now. You just create an emotional scene, and you get the attention. And then that's how you get controlled by someone else. They just display some emotion. Oh, they're upset, and then you have to follow whatever they do. Now, being a crybaby and getting attention when someone's a crybaby, you, know, you have to figure out if that's actually the best way to help them is to drop your life to um, follow the dictates of the emotional whims of a friend or a partner. Yeah, we can understand, it's called manipulation. As long as your boundaries are clear, like this is how I'm living my life and this is the things I like to do, yeah, you're not like some kind of mad dictator, then when someone is going to want to breach those boundaries, they do it just by being upset. Also, when you enter into the spiritual path, you have to make sacrifices. Now, Jesus you got a connection with Jesus, calls this carrying your cross. He mentions it in the Beatitudes, that you'll be persecuted for following the path. Yeah, so, and you have to carry your cross. This is exactly what it means by carrying your cross, is following the teachings and you're going to get hassle. You can't follow the spiritual path and be in this world as a worldly being. It's impossible. You're just a worldly being. That's what everybody else is doing. So when you actually start to live differently, you're going to get hassle. And you have to carry the cross. You have to be persecuted for the Christ consciousness. It's just the way it is. You have to stand up for your truth. You have to not care what other people think. When it comes to your own spiritual wholeness and well-being, otherwise you'd just be weak and easily manipulated, and you'll feel inside that you're not living your truth. Over time, and this is the in the enneagram that we know, we call this the let's call it the two energy when it's not working. The two energy when it's not working is. I will say I'm helping you and unconsciously we're unaware we're resenting doing it. And over time that resentment builds up to your snap. That is the unconscious two energy. The conscious two energy is knowing who you are and having the ability to help people. That's the gift of the two is they naturally help people but only when they know themselves and they know their boundaries. Now, so on to be on the religious path in a religion requires ego sacrifice. Otherwise, if you're just doing what you want, you're just a worldly person. So you have to follow the rules. You have to follow the commitments of the, the lineage holder. Yeah. And so when in the tantric path, you have a, for, for instance, when you take an empowerment, Ayash Yoga Tantra empowerment, you have a commitment to do SOG every two weeks. So that's a commitment to meet up with your community and celebrate and make offerings to yourself and the Buddhas. Um, you call it zikr, but it's this offering. It's an offering ceremony. We have a commitment to go. 
So at the moment with us, we just do it once a month. Yeah. Or rather than a commitment that you have to move into the monastery and actually live there and do, you know, do whatever you're told. Like if you take ordination, that's a, like a real, now I'm following the religious life, not my own ideas. Yeah. So once a month, that's not much. And if you say to your partner, this is what I do, this is my spiritual life, this is my religion. And I go once a month rather than every day. And you cave for that once. Doesn't feel good. Yeah. And it's once a month's a pretty relaxed commitment. So it's like we're talking about people who are killing themselves like, and there's lots of despair and anguish and misery. And so committing ourselves to the spiritual path is committing ourselves to helping others. And it's creating community that other people can come as a refuge and committing to that. That's then the power of that commitment, the power of the promise that you're not going to flake out when things get difficult. That's important. It creates an energetic sense. As you go deeper into the spiritual path, like what you're saying, going from the intellectual to energetic, what people feel through how you're living your life and what you're prepared to live for. And the deepest meaning of living is to relieve the suffering of others. It's like real meaning. I am um, not really that nice, but it scares the shit out of me to think about not being nice and also what I deem as nice, feel strongly societal and conditioned and I am going along 100% with this yeah we have to come up with our shadow side and face our shadow side it's very important and just being honest with who we are and recognizing the impact of conditioning what we're told how we should be and how we actually are My life, or my own delusion, currently seems to allow me next to no time for formal practice. In fact, energy and power I am struggling to find. I am working five days a week. I would like to work less for now. It is not an option for various reasons. I have been poor with money in the past, and I know there is something to be learned for me in working and learning how to be financially stable and independent and being able to give, give rather than always take. My job is good though, and I work alone almost the whole day with very little stress or chatting. However, it's interesting to see how committed I am to waking up early, getting to work on time, being a good worker, all in the name of money. I do tell myself that it's not just for money, it's to start the process of being able to have a family. But still, my commitment to that seems far greater than my commitment to God right now, which really disturbs me. You know, I mean, we have to work and we have to, you know, eat food and things like that. It's just a question of always whether we're going against our own truth in the moment 
or we cave into pressure. Yeah, and that's okay too, to cave to pressure. But as you say, as you just recognize it, but this doesn't make me happy. Yeah, the worldly life doesn't make anybody happy. Yeah, but there are times when we, you know, we have to do things we don't want to do. You know, that's called samsara. Yeah, you have to, we have to, again, get to grips with what samsara is. Samsara means that we're always going to suffer. That it's just the nature of being in this body and identified with it. It's problematic. Yeah, and you'll find when you go, you know, deeper on your spiritual path and you overcome all these problems that new problems just arise. Like flowers, like weeds just they just spontaneously grow. That's okay. So, as you say, very important that we distinguish between why we're actually doing things and why we're not. And then seeing and have the humility going, yeah, I'm just still interested, more interested in worldly pleasure than my commitment to God. And you know it because it disturbs you. Then we have to take responsibility for the entanglements that we're in. Yeah. It's like you might be with a partner and realize that you're only, you're only with, with them because you wanted pleasure and you were lonely and their physical body was attractive for a little while. You don't actually love them. Yeah. But you've got a child with them. So you've got commitments and a responsibility and whatever you do, you have to take responsibility for it. The more you see that you're unconscious, the more you see that unconsciousness breeds irresponsibility. And the more you take responsibility for your actions, the more you realize what weight they have on you in the present moment and in the future. Yeah. And this is like the karma. This is what it means. We're taking responsibility for every action. We've seen the impact it has on other people and being honest with ourselves. It's like a pillar of the path is self honesty. And just being able to sit with that and going, you know, I'm really quite selfish. You know, I'm really poor. Those months, we're not like that all the time, and we are where we are. But so this is a good sign. So saying, when it disturbs you, when you're intellectualizing the path and things are a nice idea, and you're going on in your life as you always have with these nice ideas, things are generally nice. But when you actually get down into the shadow side of who you are, it starts getting disturbing. So you've got, I just want to remind you, this is what it's like when we, when you first do breathing meditation and you become aware of how much thoughts are there. Yeah, with the awareness you realize, my mind is a mess. Yeah, after the initial fantastic meditation session, you realize what a mess you're in. And so it's similar, you're starting to realize what needs to be cleared up. Mm. And also to highlight my completely bizarre priorities, on top of this new job, I decided to train and do a half marathon, motivated by getting fit again. But truly, what am I playing at? <laughs> mm -hmm. For the last month or two, with any spare energy, I have been going running leaving me with about 20 minutes meditation a day, of which only probably 10 minutes is without drowsiness and about 30 minutes a day listening to the New Testament on the train to work. I think I am angry at myself. I have plateaued in my practice, a, phenom a phenomenon I have been observing for over a year, 
maybe more. I have had periods of pushing and striving. However, the main theme I have been feeling is futility. Maybe I have given the impression to you that I am doing well, or maybe you've seen through this all along, but I think I just need to communicate that I am not doing very well. So, this is the, this is all about self-honesty and what we want to do with our life. So at some point we have to realize that we have a destiny. Yeah. And that destiny generally means fulfillment and a sense of belonging. And we have our own unique life that will give us that fulfillment and sense of belonging. And it usually involves being part of community and understanding how God works through us as we express ourselves in the world. The lower self, the ego, tries to obtain that sense of belonging by getting achieved through the eyes of others. So when someone gives us approval for what we think we've done, we feel that we're belonging. But that's not belonging. That doesn't last and people recognize and they chase it and chase it. Approval, approval, approval. The higher self level is the sense of fulfillment that comes from within. And I'd like to say, put this in terms of music. There are musicians out there who make music that they would like to hear. And if no one else likes to hear it, fine, then they won't have a career out of it. But they'll still enjoy making music. But if people do like to hear it, then not only do they, does that inspire people more, because I know these artists, they inspire people more because there's a depth to them doing something they love. So they already feel fulfilled because they're making music. And then when it's combined with people who enjoy what they're doing as themselves in their life, there's also that extra dimension of communal belonging. But the sense of destiny and fulfillment is already there. It has to come first. Although there isn't actually a separation because we exist with other people. But I hope you can understand that difference. So you yourself have to understand how you truly want to live. Now, it's, you may truly just want to live in a Dharma center and do nothing else. Whether you have the courage to do that, that's different. And if you've got responsibilities, like a child and you can't do that, that's different. But if you're just scared to do it because you're afraid that other people get hurt, that's different. You have to figure out yourself if that will fulfill your life. Now, finding that the true spirituality over time, when we actually know ourselves within, that overspills eventually into any area of life. So, of course, you can do a marathon and be meditating. It's not a problem. But if you've not got your centre and then you do things like running, you can't meditate and do it. So it's that's the way round, if that makes sense. It's all a question of self-reflection and how you want to live your life. If you want to be a, 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 a contemplative person, that's how you want to live. Like so, a lot of the teachings tell us that's not that nothing is an obstacle in and of itself of us being spiritual. That's different than you being in a worldly situation and the worldly situation's so powerful you can't practice. Although potentially, crucial word, you could be in that situation and it wouldn't disturb you. 
just as potentially you could live in a Dharma center and have no spiritual progress. No external situation in and of itself is your mind. So you have to keep judging yourself what is most fruitful for your life. Or you're going to end up in situations after time you resent. This is important. And we always, so as we get, when we practice in the intellectual level, we plateau. It comes to a point where we're not getting any more real stimulation from that conceptual level of understanding. And this is, we're now coming into the level of boredom. Yeah, so this is a big, another big area of the spiritual path. We're well, just not getting that excitement anymore. And you can't do anything to do it, to get it. This is St. John called the dark night of the soul. When you're dead to the world, but you're not yet born into divinity. Yeah, so this is part of the spiritual journey. We can't escape our mind. I could list all the areas in which I am currently confused, but it would go on for a while. <laughs> it's all right, the mind is confused. So whatever happens, there's confusion. There are some positives though, from the last few months. I have overcome certain desirous addictions that have started now to clear my head and my faith is always slowly increasing. I cry often in love when Christ's presence is felt. This thread in my life temporarily wipes out all the confusion I experience day to day and makes everything worthwhile and beautiful. But I have some serious soul searching to do and that cannot be overlooked. Listening to the New Testament has, an, has had an impact as well as I simply do not live in a way that Jesus says is required to enter the kingdom of heaven and I am like the man that follows all the commandments, but when told to sell his belongings and follow Jesus, cannot do it, and walks away back into samsara. I am too attached to this world and all its concerns. I am scared I have been deceiving myself, and my spiritual practice up to this point has been simply an add-on to me. I just don't know the next step, and not taking a next step isn't working for me right now. Luckily for me, my work is based around helping people and I am in a relationship with endless opportunities to give and put another first. And I have the Sangha and you, so all the correct conditions are there. So, As I say, the spiritual path reveals your mind. Yeah. So maybe a few years ago, you might have walked off your job with Jesus. But you realize over time that you were doing that to get approval in the eyes of Jesus. Or to get a, a, or to get a spiritual high or to feel excited, to feel something for the ego. So it doesn't matter what the externals are, you're starting to see the ego. And the ego is dull and confused. And no matter how much approval it gets, it's never enough. No matter how much new things it gets, it's never enough. No matter what relationship you're in, it's never quite enough. No matter if you're doing marathons or doing this, it's never quite enough. It's until you realize you're never gonna get contentment through this mind. And something else has to be seen through. Yeah, you understand? So it's like, it, this is like spiritual depth 
in which you're now seeing yourself, but you're seeing the shadow side. Yeah, it's like unless you go into the descent, Jonah, unless you go into the belly of the whale. Jesus said, other than that way, there is no way. Yeah, he says, that is the only sign I'll give, the sign of Jonah, that you have to go. You have to see that everything is Guru Yoga. Yeah, that is the world is a reflection of your mind and nothing else. And then you, this is like fantastic, you're becoming honest with that, what actually motivates you. Yeah, maybe you'll get to the stage where it's like, I, like, I don't care about anyone except for me. And that's a profound insight. So yeah, it's good to be in situations where we're actually forced to be virtuous. Yeah, and like, remember what Buddha said, the most important element in the beginning is the Sangha, as in hanging around with people who you recognize are on this journey with us and they're trying their best to be good. And that rubs off on us because as you're starting to see, you don't know who you are. And we'll just go wherever the culture tells us to go or be. We are rootless in ourselves. We don't know what is good or bad. We morals are what people tell us. People say, well, you have to say this about gender pronouns and people have an opinion. They don't know anything. It's just now you're told to think this. Now you're told this is bad. Now you're told this is good. That's not where true morality comes from consciousness it knows what's to do in the moment it knows what its life needs to do to live it knows its destiny and it says of the higher self so as you say we put ourselves in that space in those conditions the best available for it to happen but it still doesn't mean it will happen the only way it can happen is we surrender to god's grace there is no other way. We cannot do it. But as you say in your letter, we have moments, we've always had beautiful moments where we taste it. And we hold on to those moments. And we put ourselves in situations where they're most likely to happen again. Because we recognise that's where life is meaningful. Yeah. And the rest is just activity and distraction until we come to those beautiful moments of being able to be with a sunset, being able to sit properly with our partner, being able to sit properly with ourselves, doing an action that we love for its own sake, not to seek approval from others. Isn't it when we're lost in what we love? And we get that incredible virtuous fulfillment from being on this earth, recognizing that when we're in that fulfillment, we're in a sense of oneness with, with God. Because God is there and there's a purpose to life. That's what harmony is. When we're in harmony with our purpose and God's presence, that's when suffering dissipates. We don't have that angst and that anxiety. It's like, this is what I want to do. We, maybe we have brief moments of it. Maybe when we take sannyas, we have, we feel that. We feel that we're in an energetic harmony with our destiny. I often think about what Buddha or Geshla said. If having found leisure such as this, it is squandered, you are fucked, to paraphrase. If I, having found the path, squander it, squander it, I am truly fucked. This is an almost constant feeling in me, but I just cannot tell where the line is. When I need to let the person play out, do a marathon, or when this is just meaningless activity. 
It's feeling like the less I do for the person, the better. Letting the person just play out doesn't feel right at this moment. I get far too loose with the path, and this missing sessions is the result of my looseness starting to get the better of me. And finally, when I do get a good session in, and all this is seen as me believing my mind, and I see how the mind operates to ruin my life, I feel all the above to be just untrue mind garbage. Mm -hmm. So, again, a reminder. Leaving the spiritual path, falling off the spiritual path, doesn't send you back to, doesn't send you to hell. People are in hell. That's their, that's their life. Misery, anguish, despair, depression, dissatisfaction, competitiveness, discontent, anger, jealousy, etc. That's it. And we're all in it until we escape. So it's not that you've, you, you've, like you're squandering. It's like that's the state we're in. And your st the spiritual path again makes you conscious of your mind. So you're starting to be conscious of that's the state we're in. And yeah, time's running out. But that's what death awareness is all about. It, it's like a pressure. It's like, am I just, it's another day gone. Doing what? Running around like a headless chicken? Oh, genuinely finding my connection with God. And they say, you have to feel that out yourself. It's for everyone to feel out individually on their own. But is it true or not? That the world is... What's it? Sartre says, other people are hell. That's generally how people think about things. Other people are hell. Yeah. And you so you've tapped onto some veneer of just letting the person play out. That's the highest teaching. The so you've got a connection with Jesus and Thomas Merton. So Thomas Merton met um, Chatra Rinpoche, and he said, "This is the greatest man I've ever met on the planet." And Chatra Rinpoche said, "You know, Thomas Merton's enlightened being." Now, Chatra Rinpoche says that many Westerners these days want this like. I want to be enlightened as quickly as I can, this kind of awareness self. No. And he said, this basically said, just spiritual bypassing. He said, that wish by itself, if you're a bodhisattva, is beautiful. You want to come enlightened as quickly as possible. He said, but most people are just chasing a spiritual high. He says, basically, it's like killing the teachings. Yeah. And that these teachings would, wouldn't used to be given publicly. Because people misunderstand them, misappropriate them, and just think they can do what they like as a person. So just letting the person play out is um, that teaching is for someone who is resting in consciousness and sees that the person is a mirage. So there's no person who's deciding to let things play out. They're just letting this mirage play out. Exactly the same as if you're in a lucid dream, you could alter the dream because you're lucid, but you decide to let the dream play out as opposed to someone who's not lucid, doesn't know they're dreaming, and says, I'm just going to let this dream play out. It's meaningless. 
and it's a misappropriation of the teaching which is for that consciousness that is seeing through the person the person doesn't exist so you've got to ask whether this person that you're relating to you feel it exists if it feel it exists you can't let it play out because that's not what it means very important so if we're a person our job is to practice the stages of the path to get us where we see through the person that's the realization of emptiness when you realize there's no self and you can abide in consciousness see that there's no self you let it play out but if you're a person that's concerned about money and your job and <laughs> the idea of letting it play out it's absurd yeah so that's why we have teachings for the different stages not that we also don't recognize that things are awareness and we're slowly letting that soak in and we've had glimpses but that's not our main practice it's not our main path these are glimpses of a space that we'll get to and like say let me put it this way when you've had those glimpses say on retreat and you're resting there for like you have like half an hour of like whoa now imagine that's your daily state yeah and you're in that daily state most of the time but this the person comes back like you're still seeing a person you kind of seen through it there's a person and you're like what do i do and you go to a spiritual teacher and the teacher says you let the person play out you don't you no longer try and look look analyze if there's a person there you rest in that conscious state and don't worry too much that there's still an appearance of this old rainbow that you were chasing it's very important Finally, when I do get a good session and, yep, and all this is seen as me believing my mind and I see how the mind operates to ruin my life, I feel all the above to be just untrue and mind garbage, but I cannot just dismiss it all. I often do that. I think I do need to look at, at something here. If you could point me in the right direction. Sorry for the really long message. Thank you. It's all right, probably no one will listen to it except for you, so it's fine. And so, one, it's all okay. Two, this is the mind, this is the spiritual path. You're seeing how deranged the mind is. That's important. You're seeing it's not just all roses and it's like, oh, my mind's like it's a mess. Existentially, you're getting there beyond the kind of drivel of intellectualized spiritual teachings so then it's the integration of the spiritualized the, the the spiritual teachings and resting and being honest with who you are where you are this is the crux of it isn't it this is who I, I am a person like I really my relationship really matters to me no it's not like an illusion it's not a dream it really matters to me. So then we work on being kind, being a good person. Or we work on, if you recognize, I can't even be a good person. I'm just, I'm all over the place. Then we emphasize us, what we understand ourselves, whatever it is for you, that gets you to the place where you're truthful and kind. No one can tell you directly. But we can say that Buddha walked out on his wife and newly born child. And we can say that Buddha, when his wife said, 
you didn't need to do that. But it's like, I didn't need to do that. Not, it's not entirely true. So Buddha said, it's possible to have a wife and child and attain. But for him, it was impossible. Because that's how you've seen things in that moment. So if Buddha had stayed with his wife and child, would he have become enlightened? It's unlikely. But it is possible to do it. See, make that distinction. That there's no direct place that you can do it. It's all dependent on how truthful you are, how honest you are with yourself and your connection to God and being able to surrender. What connects you to fulfillment having the courage to follow it, being honest, really looking at whether your partner is intuiting that you're actually resenting them for not living the life you, li you want to lead. That's very important. Otherwise you're wasting their time and your time. Like, are you like, prepare to stay with them for 30 years and have a child. Like that's really what you want. Or are they just someone who's occupying your mind and time because you can't stand being alone? Doesn't mean that you would split up with them, but it might have a big impact, right? Being that honest, and can we be that honest? Do you want to be that honest? Does anyone want to be that honest? And balancing up our, asp <coughs> Excuse me. our aspirations with how much we are still in samsara, as in how attached we are to having someone because we can't stand to be lonely. If you can't stand to be lonely, if, say, you went off to a monastery or a spiritual centre, it might be worse, because you can't stand it. So the pain of what you think you might need might be bigger than being able to, the situation you're in. What I'm saying is there's no direct answer like that. It's all about listening to your heart, being gentle with yourself, being gentle with where you're at, recognizing your limitations, recognizing if you really do need to step out of them, etc., etc. Hopefully, the, this has been covered by what I've said, but you know, there's a lot in there, so you can reflect on it and get back to me again about you know, what you reflect on what it means and hopefully this makes sense and just always reminder before we finish to rely on a happy mind alone that's the point is that everything I've said can be condensed into that are you relying upon a happy mind and what is it that makes you happy can you accept where you're at at what makes you happy or does your ego not like it and you push to be too spiritual? Or you're afraid to be happy and you're a coward? Like those are the two kind of polarities between what is it that makes you happy and fulfilled? So I hope that answers your question. Is that like a long answer? It's a long question. So thank you very much. <laughs>